Okay, cool. Hello, um, thank you everyone for inviting me here today to speak. Um, my name's Lee, if you don't know me. Um, I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Bradford in my first year. And um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, laser scanning and how I've been using this as a way of visualising time, looking at a very particular type of Iron Age monument called Brox. So just an outline of what I'll be talking to you about today. Um, so I'll be going through an introduction to my PhD project, which is called Visualising the Crucible of Shetland's Brock Building. So I'm using digital documentation methods to visualise these sites, understand how um, they were conserved and preserved in the past, and how we can present them today. Uh, so I'll be giving you a quick background as to what Brocks actually are, and looking at the sites that I'm studying, so Yaltov, Musa, and Old Scat Ness, and their significance. I'll also explain a bit about what digital documentation actually is. Um, and then lastly, I think one of the most important things is looking at how these new 3D records I'm producing and the archive records that I've been producing in the past um, can provide new visual data and information about these important sites. And then lastly, I wanted to mull over really the idea of presenting time. We kind of touched on this uh, just, uh, just in the last session. But, um, yeah, this whole idea of notions of how time has been presented visually through the past, uh, how different approaches have been used, and I'm going to think about this in the context of using 3D data. So, um, project background. Um, so, the title, yeah, I mentioned that already. Um, it's a collaborative doctoral partnership between the University of Bradford, so I'm based at Bradford, but I'm also working alongside Historic Environment Scotland, who are helping me do the survey work, and also Shetland Immunity Trust, who are providing a lot of the archive data. Um, it's developed um, to look at 3D um, techniques and use them to analyse Musa, Yaltop, and Old Scatness. The reason why these three sites were chosen is because they're on the uh, tentative list for World Heritage Site listing as of 2011. And so I'm hoping that using this data we'll be able to well, hopefully push it um, towards the final bid. Um, um, so the key objectives of my uh, research are to look at how these techniques can be used to better understand the archaeology of these sites and the connections between them, as you'll see later, they are very, very close together. And um, helping, and I also want to look at how um, these can be used to develop a active conservation and management plans for the sites, especially as this bid goes forward. Um, to look at the history of consolidation at the sites, because um, really this hasn't been well publicised and published in the past, and also to develop these novel approaches to presenting 3D data. So where are we in the world? So rocks, they're only found in Scotland, mostly in the North and Atlantic West. Uh, but the sites that I'm looking at are here um, in Shetland. They're all based in the south of Shetland. Uh, two are on the mainland, so Old Scat Ness and Yaltov. They're only at less than uh, they're less than two kilometres apart. And Musa is uh, situated on the now abandoned Isle of Musa, which is just a couple of kilometres north of these two sites. <coughs> so, what are rocks exactly? Um, well, the easiest way to, to describe them is prehistoric dry stone towers or roundhouses. Um, the debate uh, about the term terminology has been ongoing for many a year, but I won't really go into that. They're only found in Scotland um, and they were built between around 400 to 200 BC from the Iron Age. And you can see from these images here, this is Musa Brock. It's the best preserved brock in the whole world. And uh, these sites are really characterised by only one entranceway, no windows. And also, you can see from these reconstruction images, they have two massive thick double walls, and they also have galleries and cells in between these, and also passages and a spiral staircase that leads you up to the very top. And now, they're very often interpreted to be defensive strongholds. They are massive monumental sites when you when you see them in person. However, um, but there's again, there, there's been quite a few different interpretations as to whether this was really the case. We do know that they were occupied, they were lived in, um, they were used as houses, uh, they, they were central halves in the middle. Um, and although we have no remains of them, very often interpretations of rocks do seem to, uh, to commonly, it's commonly accepted that they had multiple floors, whether these were made out of perishable materials like timber, or whether they were just smaller mezzanines using similar materials. And also, <coughs> we seem to accept that they were roofed, although whether um, but different interpretations of how these these might have been built, and that's kind of been uh, kind of bashed around in a lot of Iron Age theory as well. And um, so the common kind of the common depiction of Brocks is using these kind of conical roofs using thatched timbers. But um, as you can see in Romankovich's interpretations, she thinks that they were more wattle and all lashed down because it's so windy over there. Well, they might have blown over. Who knows? Um, also, they were would have been multi-phase settlements. So the rock towers themselves weren't the only 
features on the site during the Iron Age, there's later um, around houses and real houses, as you'll see later. So the three sites that I'm looking at, uh, the, uh, the one that I surveyed this summer mostly was Musa. Um, like I said before, it's the best preserved rock in the whole world. You can still um, go to the site in the summer <coughs> and you can enter it through its um, main entranceway. And then as you can see in the centre, there's lots and lots of different features, though interestingly these um, these wouldn't have all been used at the same time. However, if you went to the site today, what you see is a palimpsest of the central hearth, of these different seating areas and the staircases that lead to extra parts of the site. So you're seeing lots of, a whole mixture of different times really at once. Um, in comparison to the other two sites I'm looking at, Musa really stands in isolation. It's just a tower on its own. There's no really other standing remains of other features across the site. So that's quite different. Because as you can see at Yarsov, um, in comparison, um, this is a massive palimpsest site. So the, the brook itself is this part here. You can see, just make out this kind of hemisphere. And it's on this side here. So you can see the site, it's been heavily eroded um, in the past. And most of it's been lost to sea. I think we've got about half of it left. And then there's also these extra Iron Age features, including the extra the wheelhouses that have the, uh, the brook. And this site, it's really quite different because we have such a long-standing history of use. So we've got Neolithic dwellings down here, and also some earlier Bronze Age roundhouses, the main and uh, the main rock um, settlements is right here, and then we've also got like, some North settlements, and then the Laird's house, well, the site for which uh, Yarsov is named after, is actually built directly on top of the rock itself. Um, so the Iron Age remains, they were only uh, revealed and excavated in the late 19th century. Um, in comparison to that, we've also got Bones Cat Ness. So this site is completely different to the other two in that it was only revealed in 1975. Previous to that, no one knew it, is, it existed. Um, it was discovered um, as part of some roadworks that, uh, that were being uh, constructed towards the airport at, um, Ch in Shetland. And then when the site was bought by Shetland Community Trust in the early 90s, um, it was excavated by the University of Bradford and the Trust. And in comparison to the other sites, which were poked about with by antiquarians through various centuries, um, this site, it's a complete uh, intact brock and late Iron Age site, and it was fully excavated using modern archaeological methods. So we've got a full record of all of the drawings, of the excavation as it was happening, and I'll be able to use this in my research. It's quite different to the other two um, because we have so much data. So you can see the central brock in the picture, We've also got these wheelhouses here, across um, these other side parts of the site. And then also we've got some later Pictish period um, features. So this house here, which is built directly into the rock, so quite different in that way. So digital documentation techniques, essentially they're non-invasive ways of conducting survey. Um, so the main me the method that I'm using is called laser scanning. Um, people might be already aware of this, uh, but essentially the, the way it works is you use a device called a laser scanner. And um, in, in setting it off, it's able to capture 3D data across all of its surroundings. Um, it's, it shoots laser points, so you're able to get measured distance measurements. And then when it does that thousands and thousands of times in a 360 degree angle, um, both horizontally and vertically, you're able to connect, collect all of this data. So as you can see in this image here, <coughs> the interior of Musa pieced together from various laser scans that we did in summer uh, this year. And this is the entire Musa. Um, when you piece all that data together, you can create a full 3D solid model, um, which is the case here, which saw this earlier. Uh, oh, it's not spinning around. Um, but there were some earlier laser scans conducted at Musa, only on the exterior, however. But what's quite exciting is I'll be able to compare that earlier data done in 2002 to the work that was, um, we've done this summer. So we've got 15 years of difference there. Uh, I'm also using photogrammetry, uh, so I'm sure many people have heard about this technique now, so I won't really go into it in much detail, but essentially by taking digital overlapping photographs, you can put it flat into some specialist software and produce point clouds, which again can be then used into uh, fully modern 3D models. So I'm also using that technique as it's complementary. So, yeah, so going, finally, so going into the actual meat of my presentation, um, so talking about these sites through time, well, I've already mentioned Old Scatness, it was only discovered in 1975. 
um, but it's also completely intact. It, compared to Yaltov and Musa, which have been known and poked about with by antiquarians, um, what we've got here is a site that's um, highly significant because the research that has been um, conducted here has revealed some real connections between the archaeology of Skatnes to places like Yaltov. Uh, for instance, the real houses that were exposed um, we can see some real archaeological con uh, architectural connections to Yaltov. So one of the wheelhouses has a dividing wall right in the middle of this wheelhouse, and we can see very, very similar structures at Yaltov. Um, excitingly, also at the, uh, Old Skatness, um, we can also detect traces of individual builders. So the way these sites were constructed was using the dry stone building technique. And at Old Skatness, um, the excavators revealed that there were similar patterns and choices in stones being used at certain parts of the site, and they could find that across different areas. So what that suggests is potentially the same person <coughs> at, these, uh, at these different parts of the site. Um, so what we did this summer was uh, conduct the first initial survey of the site using laser scanning and photogrammetry. Um, so what this helps us to do was provide an initial record of the site since its excavations, because when the excavation is finished in 2006, uh, the site ha has been on display to visitors. Um, I think one of the important things to mention is the fact that since that's happened, um, a lot of the archaeological deposits are actually covered up or protected. Um, when you go there yourself now, a lot of floor layers are actually covered in gravel as a way of protecting the archaeology that's underneath. But that means that what we re were recording is essentially these kind of consolidation layers on top of the archaeology. So we're not quite recording, so uh, even though we're capturing it at that moment in time, it's not necessarily the Iron Age we're capturing, it's what has been presented to um, people today. Um, however, I think that's quite important um, because all three of these sites are accessible to visitors. And I think the idea that we're presenting well, the Iron Age is, um, that's not quite true, but then that's not necessarily the negative because um, next season when we go there in 2018, we'll be able to expose some of the archaeological layers and what's quite important is we'll be able to digitally compare this season's data to next. So we'll be, visually, we'll be able to see the differences between what we've got now and what we've got in the future and also see whether the effects of weathering even over just a single season have affected the stonework and I think that's quite important. Another exciting thing that I can do is digitise old records of the site. <coughs> so you can see here, this is the plan drawing of the whole site in 2003, so this is a rough dig digitisation I did. Um, but what we'll be able to do similarly is compare these old drawing records to the new data. So. This image here shows you some of the laser scans that were done this season. Again, it's seen the same plan view. And this is in an intensity view, so you don't see the colour data. But what we can do is overlay the earlier data sets um, using things like 3D CAD packages. We can really metrically um, distinguish any kind of differences that have occurred to the site from the excavations to now. I think that's quite exciting. So we did something similar to Musa. Um, now, Musa is quite a different kind of site because it's unique in that it has stood since the Iron Age um, and um, it's also been recorded since Norse time, so it was actually mentioned in the Viking sagas. Um, we've got the earliest uh, survey records of the sites um, were produced in the 1850s by Sir Henry Dryden. So he produced some very, very detailed survey plans and section drawings of the sites. And there were also later clearances and consolidation work done by the Ministry of Works, the Royal Commission, and Historic Environment Scotland. So we've got all of these different archive conservation records to modern times, including the, um, the earliest laser scans. So what's quite cool here is we can really compare the site across history. Um, so we, we've got some images like um, Dryden's. Again, the whole plan is to digitise all of these, and then we can really see how it's changed over the course of several hundred years. Um, you can see essentially this is the Royal Commission uh, illustration and um, this is a later uh, laser scan done in 2005. And what's quite cool about that is I'll really be able to kind of go back in time and really trace the history of how the site has changed through the past. Um, because I'll also be going through um, some archive photo photos of the site. And one of the most recent ex exciting um, revelations I found out um, was the fact that um, this, uh, I love the fact that this is a before and after. Um, photograph of this consolidation work which was done in 1919. 
So when the site was uh, when the site in Musa <coughs> was acquired by the Ministry of Works, um, they decided that the entranceway, as it was then, um, was far too inaccurate. It wasn't depicting the Iron Age, so they asked some workmen to uh, basically fill up this bit and lower it a lot. And they thought, yes, that's what it looked like in the Iron Age, although it's completely interpretative. And um, what I found out. Um, when reading quite a few records was that actually the 18, uh, the, this work here, which that this was only done in the 1820s, so only a hundred years earlier, and this extension to the doorway, that was done as, as a result of Sir Walter Scott going to the site, seeing the horrible state it was in and the fact that the entranceway was crumbling, and then complaining to the landowner to fix the site and, con uh, and conserve it. So his idea of conserving was by uh, boosting it up by several metres as well. Um, so it's interesting because we're getting this kind of history of ideas of consolidation too. And you can see that it's, like, um, uh, it's pretty much the same now as it was in the 1930s. Uh, I've already mentioned um, comparing the laser scans to these records. I'll quickly skip through that one. And lastly, I'll just go on to Yalsov. Um, so Yalsov, um, it's quite different um, again because this site, it's a real palimpsest. And uh, the Iron Age remains, they were only <coughs> discovered in the 1890s. However, it has been poked about by lots of different antiquarians and archaeologists, um, including A.O. Curl, the Golden Child, and John Hamilton. And Hamilton, he really synthesised a lot of the earlier records and data in his publication um, on, the, on his excavations of the site. However, what that's really resulted in is a massive <coughs> complex of a site, and it's really quite hard to make this out um, as a, when you go as a visitor, unless you've got things like labels um, to tell you and then help you understand the site. Um, it really is quite a big mix. Um, I thought I'd re reiterate this by um, removing the labels and it's quite hard to understand as if it's uh, a <coughs> stonework. Um, so I'm where I'm out of time, so I just want to kind of push on to the final idea I had, which was, um, yeah, how, how can we as archaeologists really present archaeological sites that are open to visitors um, using visualisation? And are we a bit too dependent on using things like chronology, um, because that's essentially the way that Yalsoft is being presented right now? And can we use 3D techniques as a way of doing this um, to a better extent. So can we use virtual reality to strip away different layers of the past just to highlight and focus only on one? And can we use things like uh, 3D printing to let people tactically, you know, have, have a very tactile way of holding the past as well? Um, so I think uh, <coughs> I'm already out of time, so I'm just going to kind of finish there and I hope I've given you some thoughts. Thank you very much.